Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at RailsConf. Uh, just so we know, who's going coming to RailsConf for the first time? Wow, that's amazing. Cool. Welcome. And uh, we're going to be talking to you today a little bit about coding dojo and how you can use the dojo to improve your coding skills and uh, become better developers. My name is Carlos Souza, and this is my friend David Rogers. We, uh, we're both from Orlando, Florida. We work for Code School, and we love development and we love teaching. And that love for development and for teaching others how to develop uh, brought us to the Coding Dojo. And we formed our Coding Dojo group back in Orlando a couple of years back, and we ran that uh, biweekly for about two and a half years. And uh, we also used it, the Coding Dojo as a teaching tool. So what we're going to do here today is try to teach you guys a little bit about our experience running the dojo. And we're actually going to run a dojo here with you guys. And hopefully you, you can run dojos on your own, uh, on your company, with your friends, uh, on your local meetups. And this is a message to all developers, right? We're all developers here. Even if you're not, uh, if you don't spend your day-to-day -day coding, I'm going to ask you to put on the developer hat for just a little bit to understand where we're coming from and then the problems that we're trying to solve with the coding dojo, right? And we have different levels of ex expertise as developers. Maybe you're a beginner uh, developer. You're just starting. You're on the first couple of years of of working with uh, software development, with Ruby, with Rails, maybe you just graduated a dev boot camp, maybe you just graduated college, or maybe you're going through online classes and learning how to program in Ruby and JavaScript and whatever. Or maybe you're a little bit more advanced, you're more on the intermediate uh, level, you've been working with uh, some programming language and framework for a couple of years, you're starting to get more responsibilities at work, you're starting to lead projects, and Maybe you're even more expert. Maybe you've been working with uh, software development for maybe over a decade. Maybe you're an architect. Maybe you're responsible for the ar architectural decisions in your company. And I guess regardless of the level of expertise that you're at, you've probably realized that at this point, the technology that you're working with, it gets better. It evolves. That's the natural way of things. The tools that we use, they are, they, they're getting better. And this is especially in the open source community because there's sort of a natural selection. If something is not good enough for the community, the community will naturally look for better ways of doing something, for better practices, for better tools, better frameworks. Just as an example, Rails has an average of 100 commits every week. So things change very, very, very fast. And Rails is just one of the projects or the tools that you use on your day-to-day. -day. When you stop and think, you're using Rails, you're using Ruby, you're using, uh, you're using Bundler, you're using a ver variety of open source tools, and they're always changing. Every day there's many changes going into those projects, new features being added, old features being removed, existing features being changed. And it's really, really hard to keep track of all the changes that are going on in all the various tools that you're using. So what I'm trying to say is that us as developers, we are not necessarily getting better at the same pace that our tools are evolving. It's very hard to keep track of all the changes that are happening in the ecosystem and still being able to put on your, your nine to five and pay the bills. And it's it's good to look at other types of artists, other people that work with creativity or art, say musicians and athletes that also rely on their art, right? And they, they need to practice, right? So martial artists, like the first guy on the, on the first slide, he goes to the gym 24-7. He's practicing a lot, right? Musicians, they practice a lot before going into the studio, before putting on a show. And there's another one. Is is there another microphone, perhaps? No? There's just one microphone? Oh, man. That sucks. So, well, so, yeah. So, all these athletes and artists, they spend countless 
hours in the gym or at the studio practicing their art. So when the time comes to perform, they are prepared. So they all practice. Do you want to talk a little bit about practicing, David? <laughs> Pass the mic. Yeah, so uh, I th you know the, the one key point here is that as, uh, as practitioners of an art or a craft, we need to practice as well. Um, anybody read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, or heard of Outliers? I think the one takeaway from Outliers is that the one th uh, <clears throat> while it appears that some people are exceptional, and live outside of the regular bell curve. What it actually turns out to be the case is that they were given or have spent much more time practicing. Uh, that that uh, on average, it's somewhere around 10,000 hours worth of practice uh, in order to become an expert in a particular field. Was that was his assertion? And the, the one big takeaway uh, from the book is that is, is kind of summed up in one quote there: that practice isn't the thing that you do once you get good. It is the thing that you do that makes you good. And uh, some of you might be saying, well, I, I practice. Of course I practice. I practice every day. I practice every day for nine hours, sometimes 10 hours, occasionally 12 hours, sometimes 24 or 72 hours at a stint, and then eventually take a shower or die and fall into a coma. But the key thing to remember there is that work does not equal practice. Like Carlos was saying, uh, when you look at a martial artist or you look at a concert violinist, or you look at someone who practice a craft or an art for their profession, they don't perform nearly as much time as they practice. There's a, de there's a definite separation between the performance of their art and the practice of their art. So we can't really equate what we do on a daily basis, nine to five, as practice. That's work. We need to ship software. We need to perform. We need to hit our deadlines. We're concerned with building stuff that works. Work time is not practice time. Well, then that brings up the, ine the inevitable question, how then do we practice what it is that we do? And how should we practice what we do? What does practicing code actually look like? How do I practice as a programmer? Well, one way we could do that is to emulate how other artists practice their art and their craft. And we're talking about here is, for example, martial arts. So we have the, the term dojo, which in martial arts means the place where people practice those arts. And this is a term that was coined by uh, Dave Thomas of the Pragmatic Programmers. And he brought that to the programming world, saying we should set up a dojo for programming so we can practice code. And, and the keys to the uh, good coding dojo is that we are providing, just like in a martial arts setting, we're providing a safe, collaborative, non-competitive location, a, 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 a space and a time to practice together. Uh, we get together and we code, we learn something, we actually practice programming, we practice learning and teaching one another, and we also have a lot of fun, just like you would if you, anybody taken martial arts of any sort? Yoga counts, well, I'll give you yoga. Right, we'll give yoga, right? Uh, <clears throat> so th that's, that's really the goal of the, the dojo. But how we actually live it out is, just like in martial arts, we practice um, katas. And a, a kata in martial arts is this kind of detailed choreography of very ritualized movements that you practice either solo or in a pair or in a group. And they don't really have a direct translation to if I was a martial artist fighting another person. Like, I would not use my kata skills to win a battle. But they teach me how to punch. They teach me how to block. They teach me how to evade through the choreography. So that when the time comes to actually block a punch or throw a punch, my body remembers, even though my brain is not thinking about throwing a punch here. In uh, programming, as Carlos was saying, Dave Thomas, pragmatic programmer Dave, Prag Dave, uh, coined this term to describe, along with Kent Beck and some of the other guys, Ward Cunningham, uh, to describe a method of practice inside of a dojo. So inside of a coding dojo, just like inside of a karate dojo, we practice katas, which are choreographed patterns of movements that we practice either in solo or in pair to reinforce skills that we, don't we wouldn't necessarily use in the choreographed pattern, but we would use on a daily basis when we actually come 
face to face with that variable that needs to be punched in the head. If we break that down, <clears throat> if we're talking about choreographed patterns inside of the dojo, inside of uh, a, a coding kata, uh, as uh, Prag Dave coined it, uh, we're talking about test-driven development. And regardless of what you may have heard earlier today, <laughs> test is not a devil. <laughs> they will not. They are not a sin. Uh, and a lot of the pragmatic guys, a lot of the, the guys that we're talking about that coined the terms the dojo and katas uh, were in that deck referring to just enough testing. What we're doing in the dojo is not just enough testing. It is way too much testing so that we can practice the art of testing. When we practice martial arts and we learn a kata in martial arts, we're not punching just enough, we're punching a whole lot so that when the time comes to actually punch, we know how much to punch and with, much, with how much force we're to punch. And it's, it's kind of, if you play a musical instrument you, and you practice that musical instrument, chances are you're practicing along with a metronome. And I like to make that analogy between a metronome and writing tests when you're practicing, right? So you need the metronome when you're practicing music to keep that pace so you can focus on repeating your movements very, very slowly and with very close attention so you can uh, gradually increase the speed to which you play to you get to the point where you're shredding that speed solo and then when you play that live, it just feels natural. But for you to get to that point, you needed to start very slowly and you needed a tool to assist you. In music, that's the metronome. In coding, that's test-driven development. That's writing tests. And like Dave said, in the coding dojo, we're not practicing just enough tests. We're practicing a whole lot of tests. So when the time comes for you to write production code, you will naturally be able to tell whether you need to test drive that feature or not. And one other thing that we practice is pair programming. And pair programming is not just sitting down and coding next to someone. It requires a set of social skills. It requires knowing how to suggest a feature, knowing how to accept a suggestion, knowing how to accept a criticism and not take it personally. So there's way more to pair programming than simply sitting next to each other and either watching them code or telling them what to code. And, and again, like, like Kaike was saying, these are, um, <clears throat> these are social skills. And while they might be accentuated inside of the dojo, they definitely have a lasting impact as a programmer. I, I personally and Kaike, we, we both pair program as a part of our uh, uh, writing production code, as a part of our performant art. And we've found a huge increase in our productivity whenever we selectively and intentionally pair with others. Maybe we don't do it all the time. We certainly don't do it all the time because sometimes you just got to get stuff done, right? <clears throat> but when we do pair, we know the etiquettes, we know the social uh, currency to be able to use one of the styles of pair programming, be it pilot copilot, where I sit back and Kaike's on the keyboard and uh, he types into the, into the editor and I make suggestions or I notice uh, syntax errors or uh, I ask him questions about what he's doing and he tells me how he's going to do something and then we switch and I start typing and he plays copilot and helps keep me navigating or you use a ping pong type approach. There's lots of different types that we can, uh, that we can use. For the coding dojo, especially when we're talking about small pairs or uh, to practice pair programming, uh, in this coding dojo we're going to use a ping pong approach. And in that, in that approach, it's a lot like playing ping pong. Uh, one person serves the ball by writing some tests, and the tests then fail, right? Test-driven development, we do red, green, refactor. So the tests fail. Then he passes the mic over to the pair. His, his partner then writes some code to pass the test. I mean, they might talk, the pair will talk through it, uh, but write some code to pass the test, and then immediately writes another test that will fail to serve the ball back across the net to his partner. We'll see an example of that uh, a little bit later. We'll do uh, uh, what's called a practice kata. Uh, but what, uh, Kaiger, why don't you tell us a little bit more about the different types of katas that we could do. <laughs> Anybody have any questions so far before we, before we go on? Is everybody tracking on that, you know? Four, four out of five fingers? Perhaps just one, one finger? No? Okay. So there, there's different types of katas. The three most popular, I wanna say that it's the randori kata, the prepared and the code retreat, which is more like an event, but we're gonna treat it as a kata. 
And the Rindori Kata is the most popular for meetups and schools and university. Uh, David is a teacher at a local university in Orlando, and he uses Coding Dojo as part of the curriculum. And the way that the Rindori works, you have one computer, and the code in that computer is projected onto a screen where an audience between 5 to 15 people, a little bit more than that, gets a little bit confusing. So the audience is watching the code, uh, uh, is watching the evolution of the code towards the solution all the time. So they're constantly learning things and watching where the pair is going with the code. In, in the computer, there's always two people, pair programming, the pilot and the co-pilot. And every three to seven minutes, they rotate. So the driver goes back to the audience, the co-pilot becomes the pilot, and someone from the audience volunteers to be the co-pilot. So that way we have everyone in the room collaborating towards uh, uh, learning. And, and like Carlos was saying, I, I use this in my, um, in my courses at Valencia. Uh, we t spend the f it's an introduction to programming course where we spend the first half of the course learning the concepts of programming and practicing reading the code, reading open source projects, identifying pieces of the code that we've talked about. And the second half of the class is all these coding dojos, this Rendori style coding dojos. Uh, over the, the couple years that we ran the um, Coding Dojo in Orlando, uh, we got a mixed bag of folks from all over the spectrum, people that had no coding experience all the way up to people that had been coding for years and years and years and years. Uh, and strangely enough, the super experts were the ones that were least interested <laughs> in the format. Uh, but uh, we used it as a method of teaching ourselves new tools, uh, new techniques, completely different languages, our first attempt at a Python coding dojo was a complete dog's breakfast. Uh, but we came back, we learned, uh, we learned enough Python that now I actually run the Python user group in Orlando and uh, teach other people how to use Python and, and uh, when to use Python and that sort of thing. Uh, we, we taught a bunch of people Ruby. We've taught a bunch of people JavaScript. Learned uh, that there are like 17 different JavaScript frameworks and a new one every week to run tests or implement assertions. Uh, that's always fun. But the, the key is that we give, them, give everybody a time box, and we wait for either everyone gets a chance to code, uh, we solve the problem, which very rarely happens, or we have the uh, entire thing time boxed to maybe a two-hour time frame. So that really works well for like a classroom setting where you know you have X number of hours to participate, and you have you know, somewhere between that magic number of 5 to 15 people so that everyone can get a chance to code instead of that two hours. And one thing worth mentioning, too, is that the Randor style kata is also a great way to interview developer candidates. If you want to move away from the typical where do you see yourself in five years and cut, that, cut out all that bullshit and get to what matters, which is coding and seeing you know, how efficient your, uh, your developer is and how willing to pair program, how willing to collaborate he is, the coding dojo, I want to say, is the best way to do that, right? Because you're hiring someone to be a developer. So sit with them, code with them, seeing how well they fit with the culture, with the pair, grown, pair programming uh, culture in your company, or with the development style that your company adopts. And we use it a lot at Code School and Envy Labs, and it's worked out great, I want to say. The second type of kata is the prepared kata, and that is when you watch someone perform a, uh, a kata that has been previously worked on. So David and I are going to show that to you in a little bit. We're going to start coding a problem from scratch, and we're going to be pair programming on that problem. You can either pair, pair program or do it solo, but the thing is you're showing people one way to solve the problem, and you're showing them also a bunch of, uh, of tricks that you may use. Perhaps you're showing them how to use a different editor j that just came out, or perhaps you're showing them one feature of an existing editor that you might already use. You're showing them a uh, different API for the language. So there's different, there's a multitude of things that you can learn by watching someone perform a prepared kata. And lastly, uh, we, we actually had the, um, the opportunity to have uh, Corey Haynes. Anybody heard of Corey Haynes? If you guys know anything about the dojo, you've probably heard about Corey Haynes. Corey Haynes, yeah, he's, he's local up here. Um, so uh, <clears throat> he came down to Orlando and uh, gave what he calls a code retreat. And those are uh, fantastic all-day events where uh, you get the opportunity to pair up with people that you've never programmed with before, maybe never seen before. Uh, you. Everyone agrees to solve the same problem. He usually uses Conway's Game of Life 
which is a uh, wonderfully brain-bending brain program in whatever language you're trying to learn. You all pair for 30 minutes or an hour or, or uh, whatever the time box is for that event. Uh, you pair with different people. At the end of the time box, you're free to switch pairs. You're free to switch languages. You're free to uh, try a different approach, add some constraints or whatever. But you agree to do it all day. You get a lot of practice and a lot of time. Um, that's similar to the format that we're going to use today for the second half or second two-thirds of the, the seminar. Um, and if you want to know more about Corey Haynes' code retreat or perhaps bug him incessantly on Twitter for him to bring a code retreat to your city, uh, you can find him at his horribly ugly website, coderetreat.org, and on the internets at, as at Corey Haynes. Cool. So uh, I think we're good to move on to show you guys a uh, prepared kata that David and I uh, practice. And uh, cool. Let's do it. Like I said, uh, we're going to do uh, something that we've already worked on, we've previously worked on, and we're going to show you how to implement a very, very, very simple calculator. And, and this calculator is going to have one operation, which is going to be addition. This operation should be able to accept two numbers and return the result. Should be simple enough, right? Cool. We're going to use Ruby, Ruby 2.0. But if you have Ruby 1i in your computer, it's fine. And we're going to use Minitest, also known as test unit, for this. And that's it. We're not going to use any framework. Everything is built into the standard library. If you can, you can follow along. Or if you just want to watch it and then try to do it on your own after we're done, that's fine too. Right. So this is like the first kata that we're going to run. And uh, because pairing, because the ping pong style pairing is a lot of uh, vocal back and forth, we're going to shove the mic right up here in the front and we'll attempt to talk into it as much as possible. Uh, so uh, bear with us. If you can't hear us, just holler or throw paper or something. And also, if you have any questions, if you don't understand anything that we do, we're going to try to explain everything and describe as we go. But if you have any questions, please, please, please raise your hand and ask us. Don't hesitate. So, so far we have an empty file. There's nothing on this file, kata.rb, and we're going to develop a very simple calculator. So I'm going to fire up Vim, open the file. Can everyone see? Good? Decent? Cool? All right. So we're going to use Minitest, the unit, because you have Minitest unit and you also have Minitest spec. So we're going to do the unit type. And to run our tests, we also have to require Minitest Auto to automatically run this file. We're going to start with our test case, which is going to be calculator test. Mini test unit test case. We got our test suite class, and we're going to write our first test. So test adds to numbers. So if we change it, let me go to that same folder for in Ruby Kata cannot load mini test auto. Auto run. Thank you. There you go, collaborative. Thank you, audience. Nice. So now we got something here. Let me add clear and Ruby. Kata. Cool. So that gives us proof that we were able to import the correct libraries, we were able to create the correct test suite, and that Ruby picked it up, and it gives us a proper error message, or at least a proper message, because we don't have any assertions yet. So it's just saying, hey, we found one test. There's zero assertions, zero failures, no errors, and no skips, right? So moving on to the first failing test, I'm going to create a local variable and instantiate an object from a class that I want to have but I don't have yet. So I'm going to let my tests tell me what I should do next. If I run this again, Blah. it's going to blow up, right? So I got a failing test, so now I'm going to pass it along to David to solve that test. Yeah, thanks for leaving me a lovely mess there. It's real life, man. Yeah, this is uh, at least you didn't commit it, right? <clears throat> 
Uh, so I'm going to actually going to type only the code that I need to fulfill this test. And I'm going to do it right in the same file. Some people would split it out, but um, for, for this simple example, we're going to just do exactly what we need. Control P. And so if I just define a calculator, then that should at least change the error message. And it does. Now I have one test, no assertions, but I don't have a big giant barf. So I'm going to write a test. This is using the ping pong method. Equals or equal? I'm equal. equal. I'm going to add two numbers together, say one and one. Just do add. Right? Yep. Rerun the tests, and now I get barf. And so I hand it back off to my pair. Cool. Ping. So the error is saying there's an undefined method add. So that's simple enough. I'm going to come here and define a method add. If I run it again, now it's complaining about another thing, which is sort of good. If you're doing TDD, you want either to make the task pass or to make the message change. So this is to ensure that whatever code you're writing in your production uh, uh, part is affecting your tests. Right, because I cannot count how many times it happened to me in real life. I'm editing a file, but it just happens to be a file with the same name on a completely different project. Right, <laughs> so I'm editing like a calculator.rb on a different project, and I'm refreshing the browser, wondering what the hell is this not taking mm. effect? Right, so when you're doing test driven development, you want to make sure that whatever code you write in production, you run the test so to make sure that your code is uh, taking effect. Right. Right. The, the key there is run your tests and observe the expected failure, or at least observe that something the failure has changed, right. that you're, you're having an effect. So I'm going to save this, add it to arguments, run the tests again. Now it's saying, now it's giving us a different message. It's saying it expected nil, it, but it got two. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking, well, that's, that's, it's kind of weird. I'm not expecting nil. I should be expecting two. So that leads me to the conclusion that maybe we passed the wrong uh, uh, order to our assert method. So if you go back here, assert equal is very strict about the order of arguments, so it can produce the best error message for you. So what we should do here instead is put two, calculator add, one and one. And when we do that, and then we run our test again, we can see that now the error message is, it makes more sense, right? It expected two, but it actually got nil. Now it's time to write the simplest thing that could possibly make this work. That will probably make your skin crawl. Is to return two. Cool. So now we have one task and one assertion. Now it's time for me to write a test, a failing test, for David to fulfill. Equal uh, seven. Five and two. So when I do that, he's got failing test. Awesome. Can I ask whether you should be splitting the two tests up, or does it matter? Say that again. We should you be splitting the two tests into uh, the two assertions into two separate tests. Uh, that is a good point. I do that when I'm talking about different features, right? So there's, it's really up to you how fine grain you want to get because we're testing. It's if you look at the name of the test method, it tests that adds two numbers. So those two assertions, they still belong to that idea, to that context right. of adding two numbers. Right. right? And we, we talk about the granularity of testing, uh, just simple assertion testing, which is what we're doing with assert equal or any of the assert methods. That's like the smallest little piece of a test. That's the tiniest little piece, piece of a test. We then compose those assertions together into the unit. And the unit in this case, like Kaike has described, is just that we can add two numbers. There might be multiple assertions that describe how we can add two numbers. And as we go through the example, we'll see that and we'll start to break out well, what happens if we give it three numbers. And that's and when we break into another test method. Right. Does that answer your question? More or less? All right, great. So I've got this busted up test sitting in front of me. So the simplest thing that I could possibly do is I'm going to go ahead and do some math. Actually, do some work here, buddy. And now I've got passing tests. 
Uh, but I start to see already that uh, the calculator is going to be a whole lot to type. So um, I want to take a minute and just refactor. Uh, rather than typing calculator all the dang time, um, why don't we change this to just like calc? That's still descriptive of what the object is, but it's um, a lot less repetitive. So I make my couple changes to refactor, and then I rerun the tests. And uh, boy, it'd be nice if these uh, if these tests were a little prettier. But I'll leave that to another to another person. Um, now, what do you think? We've got we got the ability to add two numbers. Should we add some more two numbers, or do you maybe we can uh, move on? Go, yeah, maybe we'll move on and get a little more complicated. Yeah, let's do that. So yeah, why don't we write another test? And this time, I'll I'll throw you a curveball. You can add three numbers. Now we're getting fancy. So if I if I expect nine, three and three and three should add up to nine. Uh, but it should be clearly clear that I'm going to need to do some copy pasta here, which is a great opportunity to refactor, of course. But I feel like making Kaike work. Look at that. Ping pong, sir. Cool. So it says the number, wrong number of arguments. It took three, but it was only expecting two. So I'm going to write the simplest thing that could possibly work or change this message, right? So what I'm going to do is add another argument. But if I simply add another argument, then I make that task pass, but I make the other ones fail. Because if I look at the error message, if you could look at the error, if I could look at the error message, the green. What's that? It's too tall. The window's too tall. Is it? <laughs> right. Green. All right. So if you can see here, now I broke the other ones. So what I'm going to do is actually make. Let me fix my window. Is actually make this third one optional. If I run it again, now I don't have a syntax error anymore. Now I have an assertion error, which again is good. Right? Man, it would be nice if we could see the differences there. That, that white text on a, white back, on the, on a black background is uh, particularly You're right. I wonder if we can make this colored, right? I wonder if we could so make this prettier. Let's go ahead and add require mini task pride and make our task fabulous. So now you can see d down at the bottom here that we have a little color. Might not be able to see it clearly on the projector, but it does make a lot of difference when you're looking at your terminal, right? You get a nice big red F. Yeah. So the big F is saying that expected nine, but it got six. So I'm going to go ahead and add C to make it pass. Cool. And because I don't like reading a lot, I'm just going to remove return because Ruby automatically returns the last expression of the method. So I'm going to run this again. And now all my tasks pass, right? Cool. Let's see what we can do now. Should we add more numbers so we can refactor this whole thing? Yeah, let's, let's do think? one more one more test. Yeah. So I don't want you to cheat because I don't want you to keep adding single arguments. So I'm just going to add five numbers, right? So I'm going to copy and paste this. And copying and pasting never resulted in any error ever. <laughs> and it I'm certainly gonna... results in highly maintainable code. 25. Five, 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 five. You can tell we're mathematicians as well, right? Neither one of us aspire to computer science. Cool. So now you got wrong way. Dun, dun, dun. So back again we go. The simplest thing that I could possibly do is add fives and a bunch of, uh, a bunch of junk inside of my add method. But that seems, well, stupid. So <laughs> let's instead. Just replace. <coughs> Hello. Is that a duck? The duck. Duck face. Look at Simon. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> let's instead replace uh, this with a splat. It's my favorite. And that should get rid of my wrong arguments error. Oh God! But I got a whole bunch. 
And you know what, this, um, this running this test thing is getting kind of tedious. I don't like flipping back and forth between the windows. Uh, is there a way we could automate that? I wonder. I wonder. Well, I'm more of a um, bashy person than most, so. Um, in so we could add AutoWatch if we really wanted oh, to add right. a dependency and all that stuff. And right? download a gem, or you know, yeah. we know our way around uh, Grunt. I'm more of a JavaScript guy than a Ruby guy, so, so I know more. Oh, right. So and then and then followed by Guzzle and um, and Yak. I think is coming eventually, right? Uh, <clears throat> We could do all that and wait through like 15 minutes of downloading stuff, but I, I know Bash really well, so I'm just going to write myself a wonderful infinite loop. But I'll add a sleep so that I don't blow my stack out. And now every two seconds or so, it's going to rerun the tests, rerun the tests, rerun the tests. And I never have to touch that window again. Thank you very much. What's that? Oh, All sure. the code for the, yeah, the bash. So it's just a simple, oh, lame. Lame. Pretty simple. Um, here, let's, let's do this. So pretty simple bash, infinite loop, while true, run the tests, sleep for two. If we wanted to make it uh, even even closer to what Kaike typed last, we'll do a clear. And while I run that, every two seconds, it's going to refresh the screen and rerun the tests for me. That is the poor man's file watcher. That's just in case you're running FreeBSD or a clone thereof and do not have watch installed by default. Uh, so now the simplest thing that I could possibly do here is uh, numbers. Now, if this was JavaScript, I would probably use uh, reduce on this array. But this is in JavaScript. Uh, so what is it in, in Ruby? It's uh, inject, in, inject reduce, reduce. Oh, look, you steered me wrong. And so reduce is going to take. Uh, is it going to take the same arguments? First seed. Right. So I, I take the seed and then I give it a block. And so then I have my uh, my value and my number. I have let's, to use let's, 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 yeah. let's find out. Yeah, let's, find out. let's find out what happens, right? Uh, so we give it a block, and then we'll just return uh, v plus n from the block. Write the file and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably need to use parens if you're passing block. Oh. And the best part is I never have to touch this dang test file again. He just keeps running my tests. So now I've got, uh, I've got a reduce function that works for infinite number of numbers. I'm back to green tests, and I, I've already noticed, you know, let's just let's go ahead and make this guy a little bigger. Uh, I've already noticed that uh, I've got all this repetition in here, right? I've got calc equals, calc equals, calc equals. Oh, God. So uh, let's reduce some of that repetition. Reduce? Uh. <laughs> He's a funny guy. So I'll I'll add a little setup method. Get rid of all those. Oops. Do a little find and replace. Rerun. Hey, everything's still passing. Cool. Groovy, groovy. Should we go further? Or I mean, I think we've we've pretty much added as many numbers as we could possibly add. We could add additional tests or refactor this test to say adds an infinite number of uh, numbers and mm -hmm. throw out all kinds of different numbers inside of there. Um, or we could go do something something completely crazy and totally off the spec. We could. Uh, well. Added arguments instead of numbers as strings. Would that oh, up? yeah. Does Let's Ruby see what happens. Automatically happened. convert like PHP would do. Uh, <laughs> is Ruby as good as PHP? <laughs> <laughs> Test Ruby as good as PHP. 
So what should what what would we expect it to equal if we do uh, calc dot add say one and banana? What should we reasonably expect this to, to return to us? So that would probably generate an error, right? I would expect so. So what if instead of banana, we pass number two as a string? Sure. That seems reasonable. I mean, Ruby should be able to convert a string with Let's a numeric value, does. right? So that should equal three integer, right? Let's see. Oh, oh, string can't be coerced into fixed num. That sounds wonderful. And uh, I'll let you take over from there. So Ruby has uh, a method. I'm not sure if it's, I believe it's injected into object. It's extended, it's in a part of object, which is 2i, right? Which is gonna try to convert whatever that object is into an integer. So in this case, we're converting the string 2 into an integer. And that made our task pass. But now. But then we get back to that banana that I was trying to throw yeah. earlier. So here's the thing, we're looking at the test, at the name of the method, test adds string, right? But we want to be a little bit more specific about what that does, right? So I'm going to rename this method to test parses valid strings. And I'm going to write another test that says test raises error for invalid strings, which kind of, kind of gives us a bit of a path of where we're going with implementing this test, this test method. So what we want to do, we'll make sure that it raises, and I believe this is in the, in the plural, an argument error, and then we pass it a block, if we pass it an invalid argument. So in this case, a banana. Kaboom. So that brings us back to our original question. What is the numeric value of banana, right? Uh, uh, apparently 2i is not working the way we expect it to, or at least Ruby's doing something with it. It's definitely not throwing an error. Right. So maybe we should figure out what the numeric value of banana is. Right. Um, one way we could do that is to write a test for it, right? We could write an expectation. We expect x to be, yeah. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. Use your magic fingers. If you want, you can do it. I, I don't think that helped. Okay. No? Should I make this one bigger and this one smaller? Yeah, we can. I mean, the test, you can even make the font size on the test smaller. Does that help? Yeah. All right, cool. <clears throat> so now we're stuck with this, you know, what is the numeric value of, of banana? And so, uh, yeah. I would approach it by writing a test for it. Test numeric, num numeric, numeric, numeric value of banana. That's a drinking game, actually. Every time a presenter says banana, you have to take a drink. I, I would expect banana to raise an, ex, uh, a, an exception if I tried to coerce it to an integer, but apparently Ruby's doing something else with that. So maybe it gives it a value of zero. Maybe it's trying to turn it into a number. I know another language that begins with a P and ends with a P that does something similar that confounds many people. And we'll use that same 2i trick that you just showed me. And let's see what happens. Oh, I get a passing test. Yep. So let's, just to verify, I'll make this another value, like one. Maybe the value of banana is one. Nope, the actual value is zero. And interesting thing there, you can see that the, uh, the tests are flipping every time we run it because it's implemented as a hash and the, they're not <laughs> fun stuff. So then if the, um, if, if the numeric value of, of banana is zero, how are we going to how are we going to fi figure out that we've been given a banana instead of a number inside of our calculator? Uh, well, we could start with a little refactor, right? We're probably going to need some code inside of this block. When we run to run into a number, an argument that, that we've been given that 
isn't numerically uh, isn't a numericalized variable, variable value, something that we can uh, coerce, then uh, we need to do something different. So we'll put a little guard in there uh, because we want to raise an exception according to uh, Carlos's test. And uh, so the reason we high is we we realize that if we pass a valid string that is able to be parsed to a number, say one in double quotes. Right. So. So if you pass a string that is able to be converted to an integer, right, say one in quotes, it's successfully converted into one integer. But if we pass a string that's not able to be converted to an integer, it's going to resolve to zero. So what we realize is that the valid argument would be if n dash to i equals zero, and at the same time, if the original string was zero, then that's a valid one. Otherwise, it should raise an error. So the only reason, the only way that it's a valid conversion is if the integer zero came from a string zero. That's what that code means. Is there a reason why I'm using a triple equals rather than double equals? Because I'm a JavaScript guy. <laughs> <laughs> and my brain is programmed to use triple equals anytime I, uh, I compare to zero. <laughs> I'm sure it's actually my fingers are trying to type. Oh, you're going to type a zero now, aren't you? Let me just throw another equal sign in there. Uh, so yeah, do, uh, like, like Carlos was saying, if uh, the number that I'm given converts to zero, the number that I'm given converts to zero, but it isn't actually string zero, then that would be one of those strings that coerces to zero for us. Thank you, Banana. Uh, yeah. Can you test if, you, if you coerce it to a string, whether it's the same as itself, as an alternative? Take a number, sorry? Take, take, take whatever comes in and coerce it into a string and test it whether it's the same as itself. If it is, then it's, it's a literal, it's a, it's a string. So, uh, same as that? Uh, well, you don't, I don't think you need a second bit, yeah. Let's see. Doesn't look like it. Apparently not. Yeah. Right, now valid strings are failing. But that's the beauty, again, of the dojo. If there's something that I want to experiment with, I'm, I'm at green tests. I can try something else just, just to see, well, how does Ruby behave this way? All right. So we're going to take a little break so you all can... Yep, Project Euler is a great... If, if you don't know about Project Euler, spelled Euler, E-U-L-E-R, Euler, Euler. Euler, hello, uh, <clears throat> projecteuler.net uh, has a ton of, of uh, computer science problems that seem trivial at first, but if you implement them in the most trivial manner possible, you'll do something silly like blow out your recursion stack or take an hour and a half to compute the result or something like that. So you have to think about them a little more, but you can do it in a test-driven style and uh, and once you get passing tests on your hour and a half long solution, then optimize, refactor, and get a more optimal solution. Figure it, there's lots of uh, prime number calculations inside of Project Euler, Bueller, Bueller. Uh, you'll never forget that now. Uh, Code Wars is another. That's a, a that website launched recently. CodeWars.com. You can sign up for. Um, uh, JavaScript, CoffeeScript, and Ruby, I think right now. They've got a bunch of code katas. They even call them code katas. You get different belts starting from 8th Q and working your way up to Grandmaster Black Belt. Codewars.com. Uh, I, I recommend that to my students as well. Um, and it's, again, emphasizing test-driven. You totally don't have to do it test-driven, but it's a great way to practice. Uh, there, are, there are books on the subject, which we'll talk about at the end of our presentation. There's a great book by... Emily Clark, if I remember correctly. Navigator. The last one, last one. Yep. Bam. Coding Dojo Handbook. Emily Buck. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> forward by Uncle Bob, Rob Martin. Uh, so uh, this has a lot of katas in it, a lot of uh, very standard katas. 
uh, what we found in running the coding dojo for a great for, for two years, two plus years at that point, was that you can recycle the same problems over and over again. Once you find a couple that are easy to explain and get everyone to wrap their heads around, uh, you use them over and over and over again, and you try them in different languages, you try them with different constraints, you just try to see if you can solve the dang problem. Uh, all kinds of things come into your head uh, in the weeks in between when you do the dojo and when you do the dojo again. Uh, some of the common ones are like, Roman numeral, Roman numeral conversions. Uh, Uncle Bob Martin's f uh, famous one was the bowling game. We did that one time at the Coding Dojo uh, in Orlando. We tried to do the bowling game one time, and what we discovered is that nerds actually do not know how to score bowling at all. <laughs> like, it is, that knowledge is completely encapsulated in computer software now, and no one has committed any of it to memory, and does not even understand how that software runs anymore. We just know that occasionally turkeys come on the screen. <laughs> And we have and only if we have the bumpers up, right? So uh, those are great resources for that. Take a break. Yeah, yeah let's let's take a break, and um, when we come back, we're gonna we're gonna give everybody a post-it note, a different colored post-it note. This is some logistics. Uh, you'll pair up or pair up. You'll group up into groups of three, and we'll do like a code code retreat style coding dojo with the entire group. We got a problem for you. We've got some constraints for you. Uh, you can totally use uh, what, you've, what you've learned just right now to practice. We'll do that, and we'll take another break, and we'll do another coding dojo after that with a different problem. Cool. Uh, don't have to participate in all three. Don't have to participate in any of them yeah. if you don't really want to, but we encourage you to, to come and, and play and practice with us. All right, 15 minutes? Yep, Sounds we'll see good. you back in 15 minutes. All right, cool. Before we start, we want to make sure that everyone has Ruby installed. That is pretty much the only prerequisite just to have Ruby at least 193, I want to say, which is the version that comes with many tests, right? Who, no one except. Do you, everybody know how to figure out their version of Ruby? Everybody know how to run, write Ruby from the command line? This is how far down the rabbit hole we need to go. So if you want to see what version of Ruby you have, you run Ruby dash dash version. And in a window that you can There you go. Read. Boop. Ruby dash dash version. And it should be at least 193. For this one, I'm using 2.0, which is fine. You don't have to be on 2.0, but at least 193. And we'll show you that magic bash incantation as well if you want to use that in your, in your tests. Cool. So everyone has Ruby at least 193 and at least one text editor. Cool. Something Emacs flavored. <laughs> Not. Right, so the first problem, we want to group into pairs of three, right? So you might have gotten a post-it from David, or maybe got yourselves. And what we want to do is we want to group together into groups of three with people with the same color post-its. So if you have an orange post-it, you look for two other people with that same color post-it. Someone's going to have to get up. <laughs> Going over uh, the etiquettes real quick. Uh, test room development, as you might have seen us, David and I, doing here is red, green, refactor. So you write a failing test before you write any production code. Giggles. You make that task pass. And if you need to, you go back and you refactor, right? And then you do that cycle. That's the cycle that you want to follow. And so. just because you get to a green cycle does not mean you have to refactor. Right. But it's a good time to take a break, look, you know, look back at the code as a pair, as a group, and say, should we refactor? Is yep. there something we could make simpler? Is there something we were copying and pasting? Uh, is there a different way we could do this? Is there another test we should add? Uh, figure, you know, take, take your break, figure out what you're going to do next. Right. And we're going to do the ping pong pairing. Right? So just like David and I did, you write a failing test, you pass it along to your co-pilot. So you have three people. Most of you have three people. So you're going to have start with a pilot and a co-pilot, and then the third person is going to be the audience. Right? And what we recommend is that the audience does not talk on red. What that means is that whenever there's a failing task, you let the pair figure out what the solution is. Right? So only the driver and the co-pilot are part of trying to figure out how to make that one test pass. But don't think that you're stuck on Alcatraz or something. Uh, if you're a pair and 
maybe you're really new to Ruby or maybe just new to test-driven development, and you're like, I don't know what to type here. Do you know what to type here? I don't know what to type here. <laughs> Please ask your audience first, and if none of the three of you know what you're doing next or what you need to do next, raise your hand. We've got some helpers that are going to be walking around right. um, helping out. We'll and be I, yeah. well, walking around too. And I know inter internet, it's not super cool, but it's also – uh, uh, good to look up. And, I mean, internet's not reliable here, right? But you're more than free to look up documentation and references and, you know, ways to use the API and different assertions that you can use. This is an open book test. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, another thing to keep in mind is IRB is open game as well. If you are like, uh, like, like you saw with us when we were doing the banana test. Right. We wrote a test to, just to describe, to assert what we thought the value of banana would be when we cast it to integer. You're more than welcome to just close down your um, editor or bring up IRB uh, in whatever fashion you want to. And what is banana to I? Oh, it's zero? That's right. weird, but, you know, whatever. So, uh, like Kaige was saying, don't talk. The, the audience shouldn't, whoever the audience member is, if you have one or two people, don't talk on red. Uh, if you're not coding, keep quiet unless you're part of the pair, right? Uh, and it's time to switch. Uh, if you have an idea, if you have something, I think it should do this, or I think it should do that, rather than trying to describe too much of it in English, I mean, it might be helpful to, to talk about it a little bit in English, show your work in code, show your idea in code. Just write an assert statement that does what you think it needs to do. Ask the code a question. And this is not a code golf, right? <laughs> We're not here to show off, right, some pearl black magic that you inherited from a previous job. So make sure that whatever you write it's explicit enough so that everyone in your group understands, right. right? So if you need to write a little bit more, if you need to break that do in from a curly brace to a do in, so do that. Right. And uh, as the audience, this is like the, the one exception to the rule. If you see the pair deviating from red green refactor, like they start writing production code before they write a test, you get to say, you know, eh, or yeah. test, or if you see them sit on, they, they've written, written some code and they haven't run the test for a while. Eh, give them the buzzer, uh, right. survey says. And uh, if you see somebody starting to use Voodoo, whether or not you're part of the, uh, the pair, or they just write something, you're like, what is that? Raise your hand and say no Voodoo or call Voodoo on them. Call them all again. Cool. <laughs> Tell them to do it over. And that should be enough. So you guys are in groups. You've selected one machine to work off of. And please delete all the code that you had previously. Just make sure that you start from a blank slate. You're looking at a blank canvas, blank text editor. Everyone good to start? All right. All right. So here's the problem that you're going to do. Boom, a calculator. Oh. Right? Oh it's going to have one operation, which is going to be addition. It should be able to take a variable number of arguments, but we're going to add in a constraint. You're not allowed to use inject or, for that matter, reduce. This somewhat limits the playing field. Right. So that is the plan of action. And Any if questions about the problem, right? Cool. Everybody grabs their head around it. If you guys get done with this before we get done with the overall dojo, feel free to do what Kaike and I did by expanding the problem. Or what if we gave it strings? Or what if we gave it, you know, bananas? Or what if we threw an object at right. it? Or whatever, you know? Can you clarify inject uh, again? Uh, so uh, we were going to use. Um, numbers.inject, we're going to use array.inject, but uh, as was pointed out from the audience, we could also use array.reduce, which I'm much more familiar with from some, some JavaScript. So don't use inject, don't use the reduce methods. There is a third option available to you uh, if you wanted to look at each right. element yes. in an array. <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying. Cool. And we're going to use three-minute uh, rotation timeout. So let's bring it up here. Am I mirroring? Oh, no. I'm not. Yeah, you can just stick it over there. All right. So let's do uh, simple timer. Uh, Pop that on the side window there, on the other window. Yep. All right, so, uh, so if you need, or do we show like half of it and half of yeah, do that? The, do the presentation again. This? Yeah, let's do that. I'll be honest. I just played the presentation.
Well, well, but how do we show both at the same time? Something bizarre. It's called Moom. Yeah. I use uh, optimal layout, but it's basically the same thing. So Except if you need to start your initial code, kind of a cheat sheet, this is what we use to start. So requiring many tasks up at the top, starting off with your uh, task gaze, and then writing the first task. If you want to set up like the auto run thing, it's down here at the bottom. Remember ping pong, write a filling task, pass it along to your co-pilot. Right. Oh, you, you expect us to watch your stuff? The timer? Yeah, so then to do the timer, put the timer up on the right screen. Full size. Close that tab. You actually have to reduce the size of the phone. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we're going to give you three minutes to go as a pair. So we'll We'll give you three minutes as a pair, right, as the current pair, and then when the timer goes off, switch. And we'll do the same thing, and after that, we'll take a, we'll do a little halftime. All right, let's stop for here. So stop exactly where you are, all right? And now it's time for us to do a little retrospective on what we just did on this round, right? So do we have enough pens here? We might. Right. We at least have enough, uh, uh, group, near right? enough pens, enough pens per group. So uh, just like an agile retrospective, uh, we're gonna ask each other just three questions. What did we do well that we would like to do the next time we do this exercise? What would we like to improve for the next time? So what did we, like, what would we do well that we wanna repeat? What do we do maybe not so well, maybe, maybe we'd like to improve for next time, and did we meet our goals and why? And again, our stated goals are not, did we solve the problem? That really wasn't ever an issue. That wasn't really anything. I mean, we, we, can, we can continue inventing uh, different edge cases to test this problem again. So we can continue asking questions of this problem, uh, even this simple problem, for a very long time. So it's never really about, did we solve the problem? No, the world does not need another adder. Um, <clears throat> And most of the problems that we pick are going to be like that. But did we learn something? Did we find out something new about Ruby or about the people that we work with? Did we practice our skills? Do we feel like we have gained some skill or knowledge because of this exercise? Uh, and did we have fun? So uh, we can just we can start with the, just give you guys like a, another three minutes to figure out. Yeah. To just ask each other those three questions. Did we? What did we do well that we want to do for the next one? What did we do maybe not so well that we would like to improve for the next one? And did we meet our goals and why or why not? We'll give you guys another timer for that. Just write it down on the post that we gave to you. And then we can... <laughs> uh, I think it good. Click. All right, cool. Stop exactly where you are. Go back to your editor, delete everything, and get ready for the next problem again. Same group, same three-minute rotation, but now we're going to do a different problem, right? Still on the calculator realm, still going to be an addition, but now your, calc your new calculator that you're going to start from scratch is going to need to take strings as arguments. As an example, you're going to add one as a string slash two, and it's going to need to return the integer three, The integer well, to make it live. Yeah. Stop wherever you want to stop. Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe there was an earlier presentation on just enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you can choose to use. You, you can choose that that um, last constraint that we offered. The don't use inject. You can take it or leave it. Right. Uh, doing the calc add with strings might be more than a big problem to solve. Right, so yeah. if you want to use inject or reduce or yo mama, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, only, the only requirement that we'll have is um, you have to take, you have to accept strings like one, two, three, four in, in words, T H you know, E. You can go up to 10, you can go up to 100, I don't care how far you want to go because uh, 
there may be some typing involved. Right. <laughs> it should return an integer. And your calculated class, we're not going to do integers. Uh, we're going to forget the integers. Forget. Erase, delete what oh, you had. Okay, great. And then start from scratch. Right? And, and really start from scratch. Even back to the boilerplate that we gave you guys. Right. All right, everybody, uh, pencils down. Yeah. No more coding. Just like we did before, quick retrospective, write down things that work well for this round, things that could have been better and need improvement for upcoming rounds. And uh, also as a process as a whole, like what did you guys like about the whole process? What did you guys what would you guys improve about this workshop if you were to go to it again? And do you, did we meet our goals and why or why not? So we'll give you a couple minutes to do that real quick as a group. No more coding. I will come by and delete your files. So did we learn something? Everybody learned something? Feel like you pull, pulled something away? Uh, did we practice? Do you feel like you've practiced some? Did we solve the problem? Some? Solved some of the problem, right? Ish. Solved ish, the problem. Do we have fun? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So if you want to know more about the Coding Dojo, uh, this is KK's new favorite book, <laughs> Coding Dojo Handbook. I'm totally picking up a copy. Uh, there's way more resources out there. There are local meetup groups. You should take this to your user group. We started a whole group around the Coding Dojo in, um, in Orlando. But we also, because I ran the PHP group and I ran the Python group at the time, we also used the, the Python group and the PHP group. We'll probably do it again at Node. There's, we done, we've done it at Ruby. We've done it at all the user groups around. Um, if you want to know, if you want to get some starting points for that, I wrote a blog post on getting started, like getting past all the yak shaving of setting up the automated tests running in the background mm -hmm. and the boilerplate for each one of the uh, for each one of the different languages you want to try. That's in the Orlando Dojo repo on um, on GitHub. It's uh, the Orlando Dojo organization. Mm -hmm. on Talk GitHub. about meetups. But in room, the best way to actually experience more of this is to do it in practice, right? So. So go into meetup.com and look for nearby Coding Dojo meetups. There's plenty of them out there. And if you don't find one, more than welcome to create one yourself. All you need is a friend who you can pair with every week or so. And then if you just put it out there, put it online that you guys are meeting every uh, week at this specific place at this specific time, people will show up, believe right. me. All right, just be consistent. Yeah, just be consistent. And uh, I think that's it for today. If you guys want to talk more.